Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I'm Chuck. <laughs> Is that your best radio voice? <laughs> Trying to change it up. I listened to myself a little bit. Uh, <laughs> had a caller go by. I really I'm guys, Chuck. I like you guys' stuff. And I was like, cool. Let me go back and listen to it. And I'm like, wow. Huh. So I'm just trying some different voices. So I my, you I, did I like tell you my, my Barry son? Manilow, or, <laughs> What's that Barry one dude? White. You always Barry White. Barry White. My Barry doll Charles didn't die. I'm a white guy. I'm yeah. super white. Barry Manilow and Barry White are very different. No, I know. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fucking white guy. <laughs> it's like Barry White is black and Jack Black is white. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, this is my Barry um, White voice. <laughs> um, so, um, this week we got. Uh, I don't know about you, but um, we got some messages <laughs> and I want to tell you, mm. this is, we, we have somebody back. We said we we're going to have them back, but uh, we got some messages asking, Hey, you know, you, you have this guest on and uh, he says he was in a helicopter crash and then just moves on. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I got those messages. I know you got a couple of them, Chuck. So I wanted to defend our honor real quick because yes, we know. And yes, we heard it. But sometimes when you're interviewing somebody, you're not sure how much you should pry into certain subjects. So you go based on how they react in the moment. Right, right. And then we talk about it later. And in this case, yeah. our uh, our good friend was like, oh, yeah, no, I could talk more about that. It was it, I just mm-hmm. didn't know. If, so, Chuck, based on those messages, we have a returning guest. Yeah, you guys know him. His name is Brandon. <laughs> He was followed around by a documentary film crew um, <clears throat> called Highway to Hell. Well, the title was called Highway to Hell, but the film crew is like Discovery or some shit, right? Yep. Brandon. All right. So, Highway to Hell is um, a good name for like called a called Highway song. to Hell. Um, and so we really wanted to dive into that. I'm going to ask some more questions regarding that. But he just starts off, and, you know, hey, I was involved <laughs> in a helicopter crash. I don't like flying anymore. Next. <laughs> yeah, that's my bad. that's that's tense well no for us and i know a your lot of family it... was like hey man <laughs> what's going on yeah. yeah and a lot of people you know they they don't know that maybe that's a cue from somebody they don't want to talk about it <laughs> so in the in instances where you're not sure if somebody wants to talk about it you know it's just polite to not pry on the podcast where it has to all get cut out anyway. (laughs) So anyway, welcome back. Thanks for having me. So just based on um, some of the questions I got, um, I think Chuck, we should probably just have Brandon walk us through, you know, the whole sequence of events leading up to the crash. No. Yeah. Yeah. I think that'll probably cover about everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I mean, like, your thoughts and your feelings regarding it and, like, you know, how you felt of flying before. Because I don't like flying before, and I know that we talked about it off air. Um, Brandon, I was up in a plane, and... um, Or I think we talked about it on the show, actually, a little bit. But um, I don't like flying because when I was in the military, I almost died in a fucking Cessna. I mean, it was not a Cessna, but it felt like a fucking Cessna. Some propped ass plane going from fucking one puddle jumping place to the next. All of our gear like fucking strapped down on top of this fucking thing. I felt like I was in a third world country, but I was in the United States. And I was going from one place to another place. And I think it was Palm Springs uh, International Airport. We can call that international to a great place called 29 Palms. And (laughs) we almost fucking died. Like, dude, this thing was like dropping out of the air like 20 feet and I don't like flying from that. I got to take Xanax when I get on a plane. I don't like it. I do not like it. If I can never fly again in my fucking life, I would be just fine driving in my car. I don't need to go. I don't need to go to Tahiti. I don't need to go to the Bahamas. Fuck that. I will drive. If I can't drive there, I don't give a shit. I don't want to go. So yes, talk about how 
when you like your first like before i didn't give a fuck i love flying dude i'd be like oh i'm flying i'm floating in the air like you know like when i was a kid yeah you know, walk us through like how it, star- how it started how the whole yeah. thing yeah and then we'll get to how you felt about it yeah um so first off the show it's here is a fell's highway it's on the discovery plus app if you have it Hell's Highway. Like, ah, Chuck's Highway. Was, was, I, I was right. Up, highway to Hell is I, know, I was looking it up. I was like, I, I fucked that up. Highway to Hell is a song. I know it's mm-hmm. ACDC. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's a good name for a song. I didn't know they See? had a show the same time. I haven't I do seen that. this thing in a long time. Um. Anyway. So, yeah, you were on that documentary. Yeah. So, um, the helicopter crashed beforehand. I love flying in helicopters. You used to jump out of them, jump out of Blackhawks. Actually jumped out of a um, Chinook. It's a lot of fun. And then so fast forward deployment, like I said, one week to the day we actually got to Afghanistan. Um, So we load up. So you get, everybody sits on the outside of the aircraft and you put all the rocks on the inside. So we load up. They had a generator on there. Dropped it off. Sorry, backing up beforehand. I first walked onto the aircraft. I looked up and saw an Australian flag. And Chuck, I don't know about you, but when you talk to people that deployed, they have a lot of deployment stories. Well, one of the um, common ones was that Australian pilots are fucking crazy. Like they fly super low, they go super fast, like it's fucking a crazy ass ride. So I saw that flag, first thing is like, wow, this is going to be a crazy fucking ride. I wasn't wrong. Um, so we load Fair up. Dinkum, mate. I don't know if that's <laughs> right, but it sure. just popped in my head, guys. <laughs> um yeah so we go flying around drop off the generator at one fob um we go two hours and i didn't know where we were at the time we were coming in for landing but it just starts violently shaking like up and down up and down um so and then ne- just for the record as a as a recent student of helicoptery if if i can make up a board on the spot <laughs> um that's not a good thing Right. <laughs> um, I was not a helicopter expert, but I can say no. That's not it. That's not <laughs> right. Like I, I was not <laughs> in that helicopter, but you telling me about it, and you're not a helicopter expert. We both agree, as non-helicopter experts, that what you were experiencing was bad. <laughs> yes. Yes. Very much so. Um, right. <laughs> so violently shaking up and down. I remember looking over to everybody around me, and they just got their head in their laps. I'm like, all right. And then next thing I know, we hit the ground. I'm like, that makes sense why they did that. Um, so, so you didn't realize what was happening? No, I had no clue. We didn't have a window. Couldn't really look out. There was one window, but it was to the back. How do you um, think everybody else figured it out? I don't. They're smarter than me, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. That's amazing. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, and in the process of it falling, come to find out later, we had a tail gunner that actually fell out. But one of the squad leaders oh, sitting shit. on the edge caught him and brought him back in before they hit ground. Um, so, God damn. Hit. Was oh, it were yeah, you not dude. tethered in or anything? Not, just, no, he was tethered in. Uh-huh. But, I mean, he was going to hit the ground first before the helicopter did. So, oh, yeah, yeah. There's like some slack. So we um, pulled him in and then we hit the ground. And the first thing that popped in my head was this is a movie. This is going to explode in like any second now. I mean, you need to get the fuck off. So I go to <laughs> right, beep, beep. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was like, this dude's right. going to explode. Um, so I go to stand up and that wall of rucksacks um, that was in the middle ended up falling on us. So we're buried. There's fucking jet fuel everywhere. Everybody's screaming, get out, get out, get out. Um, now, how's the inside? Like, obviously, I, I'm curious about this because I've never been in, God forbid, a helicopter that's gone down. It, is it like gnarly wreckage sharp you know is or is it just kind of like when a lot of car accidents where the car just ends up on its side and everything in your glove box spills out and for the most part everything's intact but there's broken glass and your shit's not where it's supposed to be from what i can remember it all remained relatively intact didn't really <laughs> i didn't really look around on my way out right um but there was, like I said, there was fuel everywhere because everything is kind of exposed on the inside. Right. Um, like there's some panels like blocking like the port and stuff and like all the spinning parts. But for the most part, it's pretty exposed. 
Um, right. Yeah, so rucksacks fell over. I don't know where we're at. And I didn't know we're on the five at the time, so I stand up. My M4 is trapped. So I tug on it two times really hard. I'm like, if I don't get on this third time, I'm just getting the fuck out of here. So it finally comes free. I get out, and it landed harder on my side, so it was kind of at an angle. They're kind of like walking uphill. And like I said, there's uh, JP8 jet fuel everywhere. So it's very slippery. So try not to slip. Kind of like fucking Penguin Wild and the fuck out of there. Everybody's saying get out, um, directing us where to go. And um, yeah, that was, it happened pretty quick. But we were all fine. We were on the fob. There was a handful of us that did get hurt. Um, nothing serious. Like I think a head well, injury. Was probably or two. The, yeah. So a couple bunk heads or did you have like sti- anybody need stitches or anything no it's nothing that serious like my huh. knees got kind of fucked up i don't know if that was from the impact since it landed on my side or if that was from all the rucks that fell on me right um but did you think one happened as the other at that point yeah did you, did you think at like at one point you guys had been like shot down or some shit like what was running through your head when you started fucking going down you're like what the yeah fuck? yeah because walk us through that because how how high up are you how soon into the like like how long had you been in the air so we've been in the air a minute. Um, like I said, we had to fly to one fob, drop off that generator, right, and then fly to our fob. So we were flying around. But how far is 20, it? 20, 30 minutes. Yeah. How long is the, are the, so 20, 30 minutes each flight has been up to that point? Yeah. So these aren't um, too far away from each other? No. No, they were relatively close. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. What was the other questions? No, Did so you you're up like, 20 to 30 minutes in the air. Yeah. And you um, said in, in jumping from base to base and you were only up for about a minute. Yes. Yeah, so we're, f- um, well, we probably anywhere between 50 and 100 feet up in the air. Okay. I said it, it all happened pretty. So he's quick. flying pretty fucking low. Right. Well, we were coming in to, to land. So we were already oh, okay. at the fob coming into land. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I can say this. You might have to edit this out. The one of the computers. Here, I can pause it with, and you can tell us, and then we'll decide. Okay. Like, just in case those things aren't out. Yeah, okay. I, I will. We'll just. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure you can find that information out, but basically, yeah. what you're telling us is that two technical problems. Yeah. So there's technical malfunction when we dropped off the generator. Another one as we were coming it's into very landing. similar. Yeah, and they yeah. couldn't flip the switch in time to go into manual mode so it just kind of fell um so yeah so it okay so if they didn't have enough time to flip the switch you couldn't have fallen very far no like i said maybe 50 100 feet because it rocked a good bit before it actually like hit the ground right right how hard Um, was that fall like how how hard did that feel metal hurts yeah you know it was um not comfortable. It it messed up the entire right side landing gear, and it actually broke off some of the blades when they hit, struck the ground because there was like pieces of blades everywhere. Which yeah. they're just like little honeycomb. Yeah, they're not things. Yeah, yeah they're designed right. to be super lightweight, and they're like if if it, I, one of the things I learned is if anything comes into contact with them, period. Whether you yeah. see a deformity or a mouth, you are required to report it to the FAA and blah. blah. I mean, they take. The rotors very seriously and understandably yeah. so. Like, makes sense. Oh, yeah. Um, so, you yeah. guys, you, you didn't, Chuck was asking if you thought you'd taken fire or anything. Did that ever come into your mind, or was it just by the time it was all over, you had no time to even consider it? Yeah, I didn't really have time to think. Like I said, didn't know what was going on. I know it was rocking. So, it's like, this is not right. And then we hit the ground. And my first thought, was that we are somewhere outside of the wire, about to get surrounded. Like, this is some movie shit. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, this is Chinook down. Yeah. You come out, you're like, oh, no, we're here. We just Pretty, found a new yeah. way to get in here. Hey, guys. <laughs> yeah, we got here super fast. Okay, um, everybody's fine. We're good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so like I said, it landed on my side, and it did some pretty serious damage. And then we rallied up. Everything was fine. And then come to find out. So my wife, she was a part of the, um, I can't I can think of it right now, the rear detachment team for all the wives. Um, I can't the USO 
yeah. something like that. Unit, the unit readiness thing. Yeah, some shit like that. And yeah. she was a key caller, so she had a list of all the people she was supposed to call. So she's telling, like, she got word that there was a helicopter crash, but everybody's okay. There was a couple injuries, but nobody's seriously hurt. So she gets all the way down to the last person. They're like, oh, you took it surprisingly well, considering how your husband was on it. And she's like, what? Like, nobody told her that I was in the crash. <laughs> oh, well, maybe they yeah. did that on purpose. They were like, oh, well, you did it surprisingly well, considering considering what? Oh, we didn't tell you? Oh, <laughs> our bad. Oh, Surprise. It's not, I mean, that's not something our government would do at all. Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, not at all. Not, not at all. That's absolutely something that 100% they would do. So this was your first introduction into Afghanistan. You're like, well, wow, that's fucking great. And then as we talked last <laughs> time, you're like, oh, and then relatively had a, had a, compared to other people's deployments, it was pretty smooth sailing. You know, you guys didn't lose anybody to get any, anything like serious firefights or anything like that. But it's still like the amount of humility that you have when telling some of these stories, you're just like, ah, eh, it was whatever, you know, like, but anybody else, any other fucking civilian would go over there and be like, this is fucking nuts. I mean, I'm browsing through heroes of hell's highway right now, where you can go watch on discovery plus, um, <clears throat> and, or on sling TV or Amazon prime video. So, oh. um, there you go. People can go watch your shit. And it's called again, it's heroes of hell's highway. Um, and it follows the 23rd sappers, uh, in country Company. yeah uh, defusing shit and blowing stuff up now on your third episode it goes bombs at the front door and i know hollywood likes to jazz shit up a lot and it says the 23rd sappers receive a bomb at the gate the second platoon walk into a trap and the third platoon become sitting ducks in the sand for a motorcycle gang they have fucking motorcycle gangs in afghanistan <laughs> <laughs> yeah so these fuckers like they're yes, they're sparse yes, and they're fucking is, quick we are uh hills angels <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So the goat. bomb on the door. Where, where are the else. genies? You know, Palestine chapter, bro. Mm -hmm. Fucking gypsies. Uh, <sighs> yeah. So that was the one I was telling you last time, where they put it because of the uh, the blimps that had the cameras that they thought were my control. So okay. Yeah, right. They you remember saw that the, one? Yeah. So they saw those and like, fuck you guys. So they put it seriously right outside of our fob, like kind of like a dirt road leads to the highway, highway one. And it was right out there. Right. So, so that was the find, one outside the gate. Yeah. So we find that one and there's a secondary one that we found as well. But the motorcycle gangs, that was outside of Leatherneck, which is the Marine base over there. It's fucking massive. Um, how what are we talking about when we say massive what compare it to i don't even know like we didn't i didn't even see all of it um because we just flew in because we had to do like some other missions there so we um went there and pretty much just went from like the flight line motor pool area to our sleeping area and it felt like a mile and a half two miles just on this one fucking base um which is in my opinion quite massive for something over there no, uh, yeah keep going i'm gonna see if i can find out so as they were rolling out this is all on the show as well um but as they were rolling out um they kind of we had some of our gear on the outside of the rpg cages um this is like the medics bags and stuff nothing i mean that's nothing sensitive still important but not sensitive and they would come up on the bikes jump onto the rpg caging Grab the bag off of it, hop back on the bike, and go away. What? Okay, just... So just just to give people some uh, some clarification, by the way, two point five square miles. God damn, it's a good base. That is That's almost the size of a city. I know. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead. <laughs> shortly after we left, um, one of the things that made the deployment so interesting is we always seem to avoid danger. So one of the things after we left is they actually. Attempted to get overran. I think they did a V-bid on one of the walls to blow it up. And then they tried to um, overrun the base. They didn't get far. You got a bunch of armed people there. Um, but, yeah, so there's motorcycle gags. Because we always got worried that they were going to jump on. Because they could easily, like, grab a grenade with the magnet, put it on there. And, right. like, now we're um, vulnerable and shit. 
but anybody uh, hit we're, one we're of not talking like what, what kind of motorcycles i'm dying to know like are we talking like dirt bikes like yamaha like no they're like, like old school honda honda rambler scrambler like, yeah something along like very old like 1980s 1990s hondas <laughs> that had like the flat seat and you would see up they did everything on those bikes so pretty much over there if you can see over the steering wheel or touch the ground you can drive it and or ride it. So if you can see the steering wheel in a car, you can drive it. If you can touch the ground and handle a motorcycle, you can ride it. So you see like 10-year-old kids, whole family of fives on this one motorcycle. We actually saw a motorcycle gang. So it was five dudes on bikes. And they managed to put those same bikes on the back of their bikes. So there's five people and 10 motorcycles. Yeah. Oh, whoa. What? That's yeah. some redneck ingenuity right there. <laughs> right? They found a way. It was impressive. Well, I, I don't remember who said it, but it was on one of our podcasts. Well, actually, I think it's been said a couple of times is that they're, you know, they're the rednecks of the Middle East, right? Like, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, so we actually over there around that time of the burning of the Qurans and everything. So she got pretty serious. So they tried to overrun Leatherneck and a couple of other ones as well. They didn't get very far. But yeah, I can't just, imagine that overrunning a marine base that's 2.5 square miles is going to do a whole hell of a lot. No, no, they tried though. Um, well, yeah, but I mean, there's there's some <laughs> girls that I tried to sleep with that there was it was never happening. Come on, like, <laughs> like some things in life you could try all you want, it, it just ain't happening. What did yeah. that sound like when they tried to run that shit over? Like, did Hellfire oh. just open up and they're just like. So this was all after we left. Like seriously, oh. when we when we left somewhere, you are the happened. company that like you're the opposite of a ship magnet. It, with yeah. the, with the exception of that goofy crash, but even that crash was like, oh, we'll give you a crash, but you know, <laughs> it's it'll like, be inside fun. the fob. And it's like when I was in, it'll mildly um, inconvenience you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when I was in. Like we had at our at our, at our barracks and shit in our in our battalion. Like we had some weird shit happen, and like we were. We were wild, and I, I'd seen some crazy shit happen, like dudes losing their minds, fucking, you know, tripping on bath salts and stuff. And you're like, well, it was fucking wild. And then I left, and I got out of the military, and then I started reading the stories that were happening after I left, and I was like, oh, fuck. Someone <laughs> said, hold my beer. Holy shit, dead hookers and shit, fucking alligators, and, and, and you know, their rooms, and hookers, and, you know, fucking... God, and, damn. And, wall lockers or in coffin racks like fucking Dutch, like these people were not here when i was in i know i looked for them <laughs> but, like not even like, bad cocaine, kilos of cocaine and shit being oh. found i was like what was going on like that this shit and it, like, it had to have been happening while i was there but like i just didn't see any of it you know like i mean i'd seen some crazy shit maybe you know? nice. you're not what a scumbag fuck? fucking soldier or marine or you know. <clears throat> no but like after i left it's like NCIS so they, came down and like there was investigations and I was like holy fuck and everyone's like he sees that show NCIS like when they come investigate no dude they're whatever because I had been investigated not me personally but my unit the whole unit in the um my whole platoon in boot camp was investigated of course the NCIS. navy would investigate your unit <laughs> yeah <laughs> so they actually investigated us during like our drill instructors all the 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 fucking um uh, boots and the recruits and shit we were being under investigation through ncis because there was you know hazing and shit going on some kid got fucked up and it got ramped up from there like some, they ended up breaking some kid's arm but like nothing ever happened and ncis God. came and they went you know there was uh ncs was also investigating for this chicken shit stuff uh recruits smoking cigarettes <laughs> what on the fucking uh in the barracks <laughs> Oh, that God. was my my Dude, platoon. That's some Paul Blart <laughs> and dudes were doing it. I knew him. It was funny, and shit was like prison, bro. Like dudes were sneaking in cell phones and their fucking uh and their Old Spice deodorants, like making holes and shit, and like filling it back up. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck is going on? Dudes shoving fucking peanut butter in their crotch just so they can eat it in the middle of the night because they're being so starved. Weird. Like Shawshank Marines, dude, dude. Just some wild shit. And then you, and so NCS was like, whatever. But like when NCS came to investigate where I was staying at the second amphibious assault vehicle battalion, they, they were finding some wild shit when I, after I had left and I was like, dude, this is fucking wild. So it's just, it happens. Like, were you like, you're there and you're like, yeah, that was some wild stuff. But 
nothing seriously crazy and you leave and you're like the fuck dude everything just fell apart went crazy yes so um before so this company ended point three times one time before this one and then one after my deployment so before their first one they um doing a whole battalion formation the company wasn't there like what the fuck this is like a couple weeks before they were going to leave and come to find out that they found a meth lab in the um janitor's closet okay oh yeah god yeah that's amazing (laughs) dude what am i ncos sergeants i bet you I, wait, wait 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 hold on I, how would the marine corps clean up a meth lab i guarantee fucking to you they just had some lance corporal fucking sweep that shit out <laughs> just get rid of this away <laughs> no they bring hazmat <laughs> he's all i know <laughs> a bunch of lance corporals <laughs> pfcs <laughs> and privates has <laughs> fucking class your mom suit on <laughs> right yeah. um that's that's fucking wild. My fucking one of my one of my NCOs. He was a sergeant. Uh, fuck, dude. We use a piece of shit. Um, uh, I don't remember his fucking name. That's how much of a piece of shit he was. But I remember his little his little ferret looking fucking face. This asshole was a <laughs> cocksucker when we were in, and and then he started trying to act cool with all of us. And we started to know he's acting weird. Dude was running a fucking meth lab out of his trailer, and uh, was it Sneed's Ferry or some shit out there? And him and his little trailer trash wife were fucking had a bunch of kids and they were running a meth lab in their trailer with their That's children where they slept. He got popped by uh, by uh, local law enforcement for uh, making, manufacturing and selling uh, methamphetamine. <clears throat> and this dude was such a fucking scumbag. And then he would we would have to do um, chasing on him. So I became a chaser just because I didn't like this fucking guy. And uh, just so I could try to fuck with him a little bit. I don't know. I didn't like him. <laughs> and so I became a chaser and I never got to chase him though. Um, and he would call us every time I was on fucking duty. He would call and be like, what's up? What's up? Um, I'm not going to say my last name, but he would be like, what's up, dude? And I'd be like, fuck you, man. You're such a piece of shit, dude. I was like, you you could have killed your kid, man. I was like, dude, you're you're making a fucking meth lab. And now you think like you were buddies. Like, get the fuck out of here, dude. You're a disgrace everything we fucking represent dude get the fuck out of here dude and uh and then you'd be like no i need to talk to whoever and i'm like yeah i'll let him you know Boop. i just hang up on him constantly and i tell my you know the the fucking uh what is it staff nco the guard or whatever the fuck it was um uh hey you sh- shit bag calls and like oh he's a like, fuck that guy like dude the dude was such a scumbag he would call all the time try to get preferential treatment try to get taken out by us try to get cell phones from us we're like no nah, dude eat a dick I don't like just a certain level of hell for people that do shit like that with kids around. Yeah. Like, dude, come on, bro. Like if that thing would have blown, like you would have killed everybody, including those innocent children who know yeah. nothing of the sort. Like they're so innocent. Like the, and you're, you're growing them up in a life to become shitheads. Right. Yeah. Cause mm-hmm. you're teaching them this shit is okay to do. And that is not okay to do. So yeah, at mm-hmm. least fentanyl fucking fucks up your life fast and it's over. Right, like if fentanyl, fentanyl is gonna fuck up your life, it's gonna f- do it real fast. Methamphetamine, like, oof, it kills you over twenty years, but by the time you're dead, you're still alive. Right? You're a walking corpse. Yeah. God damn, it's terrible. Anyway, so <laughs> freaking, you guys have. I, I can't believe you had a meth lab in the closet. Yeah, like, that's that's what they said. I can't confirm. I never saw it, but that's. Uh... Yeah, when I talked to some of the people in the unit, they're like, yeah, they found it. Like, God damn. <laughs> wow. <laughs> now, did you feel like, did people say that you guys were, you know, abnormally lucky? Because I know you have another story and I want to give you time to, to get to that. But like when you said you were the, you know, I said you weren't a ship magnet. You were the opposite of it. You know, <laughs> did, did you have a rep? You guys have a reputation for avoiding trouble or was it just like, eh? Not really. I mean, if there was, I never knew about it. Um, said it was a relatively small fob, so we kind of like kept to ourselves a little bit. Um, but I mean, we would talk about it amongst ourselves. Like, hey, you guys were just here. Uh, one mission we did, um, we had to drop off this SF soldier at his little cop command outpost. Much smaller than a fob. Um, it's probably like the size of your living room or something. Super fucking tiny. 
dropped him off. It's one step above got, a foxhole, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. A couple ASCO barriers. Um, so we got Wolfhound chatter. Um, pretty much, we could hear what the enemy was saying on some um, radios. Um, that once we cross a river, they were going to light us the fuck up. We didn't know that till we got back. We never crossed the river. And then I think a day or two. You are yeah. the, the like a rabbit's foot. Yeah, super <laughs> fucking lucky. I love it. Um, but then we found out a day or two later that they tried to, they might have been successful on this one, unfortunately, over on this fob with another rebid and a couple SF guys in it. Um, yeah. So we avoided that one too. Jeez. Crazy. Well, I know you had another story you wanted to tell, and I know you want, there was some stuff you wanted to talk about that we were chatting about. So I wanted to give you the time, you know, we've, we've taken time to, to clue in everybody as to some of the stuff that they had questions about specifically the helicopter crash. Um, and it's some documentary stuff, but, uh, what was your, what was your other story? So I'm going to hit on the discovery channel a little bit, very tiny bit, and then I'll get to the story. Um, so looking back at it now, it wasn't bad because, you know, when you're going through, um, we talk to anybody that did any amount of time in, especially a deployment. Um, they always say take more pictures. So we were lucky enough to actually have a camera crew. So we had a lot of pictures and we could relive those memories to an extent. Um, but at the time, I fucking hated them. Um, they were stupid. They would always try to like hang on the vehicles, get like B-rolls and everything. But... Like I said, their RPG cages don't work too well if you're bringing them down to the ground. Um, so we'd have to stop the trucks and yell at them to get off because they were just going for a free ride trying to get their B-roll and whatnot. And then um, somebody told me, I don't know if this is true or not, but somebody told me that if you stare at them, then they can't use that footage on the TV. So anytime we were at night playing volleyball or something, relaxing, they were trying to get more fucking B-roll or whatever, I would just stand there and stare at them in the middle of my volleyball game. Like, fuck you guys, get the fuck out of here. Like, I'm tired of watching your ass <laughs> if you want to keep doing stupid shit. Um, did but, it work like or did the show air with a bunch of footage of you fucking staring at the camera? I didn't see any, so I guess it did work. Or they just, out of coincidence, they didn't end up using it. I don't know, because there was hmm. no really footage of us playing volleyball that I think of. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, I said, looking back at it now, I, I'm glad they were there. It was nice. Like I said, I have something I can go back on. We did take a bunch of pictures. And we have some YouTube videos up there as well um, of our unit, but that was nice. All right. And then my story. So we were. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Happens to us all the time. <sighs> yeah. Most I can podcasts. hear the baby starting to, to cry. So. Um, so we're going out on mission. Um, this was after the camera crew. We got to our second fob. So we at the first fob we were at, it was Kari Karez. We ended up closing them down and then moved to another fob. Equally as tiny. All we had was a gym and a chow hall. Um, which really, I guess that's all you really need. Um, that was Ozzy Zula. Yeah. Um, so we're going out on mission, and one of our routes was it was kind of like I guess kind of like a football post. They got the one in and then it kind of branches off. And then at the end of them were A and A um jailhouses. So we're doing we would always leave one truck at the entrance to the route just so that way we wouldn't have to do another deliberate clearance on the way out. We could just, just kind of do a hasty clearance and we know nobody ran up behind us. So we kept somebody there. And we're going down, and right where it starts to turn so you can go the other way, um, it was getting dark. And um, can't really clear too well in the dark, so if we don't have to, we usually don't, just because it's a higher risk than what we need. Excuse me. Um, so the a a didn't like that. So they actually pulled up a truck and pointed their gun at our truck we had back. And then along that route, there was some of those mud huts, and a couple of them had recoilless rifles on them. So we see oh. their guys getting up behind the recoilless rifles, which are like seriously pointed like our truck is on the other end of the barrel. 
Right. So they're sitting there pointing their weapons at us. And they're like, no, you're going to clear it. I'm like, we're not fucking clearing this motherfucker. And the infantry unit that was on this giant fucking hill behind us, um, I think it was, it was Gundagar. And southern Afghanistan, if you don't know, it's fucking flat as hell. But there's this one little fucking, like, little fucking pimple on the ass of Afghanistan. And um, we had an infantry unit up there. So they were a striker unit. They said, no, we'll clear it. You guys go home. Um, our command said, no, you guys can't take a hit. We'll clear it. It's fine. We got this. So we turn around. And as we're finishing up the end of our uh, our clearance, it's it's dark. And we just see these people, the ANA, walking in between our vehicles. I'm like, yo, what the fuck are they doing? Come to find out the ANA commander at the um, fob behind us with the infantry unit actually beat the shit out of these guys that uh, stood up against us. And um, we also found out that that unit had a Barrett 50 cal trained at the gunner that was at the entrance of the route with ours, like ready to take his fucking shit off. Um, so we finished the route and then we ended up staying there the night and that's when we kind of figured out everything that happened. But that was so why what was the what was the reasoning behind the afghan army <clears throat> like i mean because they they had some guys at that um jailhouse the ana compound at the end of the route and they're like no you need to clear up to them so we can do whatever it's like no we'll come back tomorrow right like, now you're going to do it now so they wanted us to do it i'm like fuck you guys but you couldn't let the infantry guys get hit because their strikers cannot take a fucking hit at all because they're just flat bottom. Right. And we have that mm-hmm. V-shaped hole that can actually take somewhat of a blast and everybody be okay. So at that point, when there's a difference of opinion, let's say for lack of a better term, um, where the Afghan army thinks you're going to clear this thing and you guys are like, nah, I'm not really going to do it. Like, how does that get resolved? I mean, I guess kind of like that. The people that said no got the shit beat out of them by their own guys. Um, nice. Because we're putting our safety first. So if it's not safe for us to do it, this is a relatively regular route at that point in our right. deployment. So we sure. would hit it a couple times a week. Made it sporadic because, you know, don't set a pattern. Complacency kills. All that fun stuff. Um, so... Yeah, we're like, we'll get it another time. Fuck you guys. And then there, it's there's no backlash. It's just kind of like, nah, not going to fucking happen. Tough shit. Yeah, I mean, it's our safety. Like if you feel like it's unsafe to clear, and they're just going to have to get the fuck over it. I mean, it wasn't for like a specific mission. So you guys anything. didn't end up clearing it. <clears throat> we did, yes. Um yeah, like well, I said, see, it was dark out. See, now that's when I'm so confused. Like, you did end up clearing it. We did, because like I said, the infantry guys said they were going to clear it, but they can't take a hit. So we said, right. fine, we'll clear it for you guys so no nobody in your unit gets right, hurt. Right. right, I understand so, that. But if you tell the... At what point can you tell the Afghanis to pound sand? I mean, literally and physically. <laughs> I mean, as far as I know, anytime you want. Because, you know, if they're, I guess that that would be my, my curiosity is at what point as the, what point can they tell you guys what to do? And at what point can, can they ever give you guys orders and tell people what to do? I, obviously nobody wants, I guess I'm thinking back to times when uh, you get a highway patrolman and a firefighter maybe arguing on the freeway and the firefighter gets arrested by the highway patrolman and then they both end up getting disciplined and all that kind of stuff. So this is like, you know, two military forces, obviously one out guns and out like I would imagine that on the ground, it's fuck you. We're the U.S. Army. If we don't want to do it, we're not going to do it. And then you go back, tell your CO, and then that shit gets yelled about at a table with stars on it. You know, is that about right? Or is it something that like they tell you ahead of time? No, you fucking have to do what they ask because. Those are our orders and we're the, you know, we're a guest here or, you know what I mean? Like, how does that shit get? When you go, it's more of the first one. Like, we're going to do what's safe for our guys first. Right. 
And then if somebody doesn't like it, then they can take it up with higher. Like, right. we're worried about us. We don't give a fuck about you. I don't hate her. <laughs> now, you, you said one of the dudes had a beer at 50 cal. Yeah. And it was, was that one of the, the infantry dudes with the, the 50 pointed at one of the ANA guys? Yes. So he was on top of that hill, and then he had it trained on the gunner of the one of the ANA guys that was essentially blocking our exit. Because he was In right by our shit truck. went that down? We, yeah. He's like, as soon as, if he pulls that trigger, I'm blowing him in half. Um, yeah. I mean, a fucking round. Yeah. That's, that's kind of <clears throat> what I'm getting at is at that point we can say, well, you know, and you can take a swing, shit. but you know, you take your swing and then watch what happens <laughs> afterwards. Yeah. Freedom is about to fall, bitches. I mean, just so people, just if people don't know, a 50 caliber round, that is a monster of a round, and the grazing fire, just the grazing fire can rip your fucking skin off. FYI, I know because I did my uh, <clears throat> MCIs on weapons, so when I was in, and the grazing nice. fire from a 50 can fucking rip your skin off. And it, and if even if you shoot a 50 cal and you get it right next to someone's face, it'll kill them. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah just they're just fucking monsters. Um, they're so... There's so such a big round that <clears throat> one of my buddies who was over in Afghanistan, he was in the army, and he was telling me a story. This is back a while ago, um, like 2000, probably like 10, 11, something like that. And he was like, yeah, I fucking was in a firefight, and uh, we're fucking on top of the 50, and we're fucking boom, boom, boom shooting into a mud hut because we were taking fire from some fucking mud huts and he's like i just lit this thing up and uh the mud hut was just taking these fucking 50s and we went through the mud hut and there's just 50 caliber rounds sticking halfway out of some dude's chest so it's strong enough to go through a fucking mud hut retain its integrity and still go halfway into your fucking chest right. God damn. that's a nasty round well and those are i mean there's a difference too like the the mod deuce you know, there's the there's like a Barrett 50. Okay, so there's like a Desert Eagle 50 cal, right? The 50 AE. Mm -hmm. Then there's like a Barrett, you know, 50 cal. And then there's, you know, like a Mod Deuce, right? A like, fully automatic. Like these are all different. Yeah. I, I mean, yes, there are there are lots of different 45 caliber pistols, but there's also 45 caliber submachine guns. And I would rather, you know, they're just same thing with 50 cals. There's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of different varieties. And every single one of them will mess you up. But the minimum, the 50 caliber Desert Eagle AE, you know, that's a that's just a pistol round. And it's going to make your day pretty terrible, even if you're, God forbid, it, I don't know that there's any vest for a police officer that's rated to stop. If, now, granted, it may not kill you, but it, it, it'll, it, you know, it's not rated to but stop. You'll, you'll know it. <laughs> You'll know it for sure. Like you may, by the grace of God, your badge, the trauma plate and the Kevlar get spared a mortal wound, but at a minimum, it's going to fuck you up real bad. So you can imagine when you, you know, scale that up to a rifle round or then even worse to a fully automatic mod deuce. Even sappies aren't going to stop that shit because we had a dude who, um, right when I got there into my, into the fleet, um, <clears throat> there was this guy and he got fucked up overseas and he got shot i think twice um in the sappies with a uh an ak around seven seven point six two seven six two yeah yeah and um he has a seven six two round stuck in him god damn and it went through that fucking thing it's like another like, we can't we can't get it out and i felt so bad for this guy because he's up walking around he's like i don't give whatever fuck it you know, like he was just that typical Marine, but I'm like, dude, that just, I could only imagine. Like, I'm trying to think like, and I just got there. I'm like, holy fuck, that dude's fucked for the rest of his life. Like he, but that's why, that's why, you know, it's oh, no joke God. when you have two militaries like squaring off against each other. Yeah. You know, one is completely outmatched, right? I mean, it's kind of that, like you can do a, you can do a little bit of damage, but it'll be on your way down to the ground, you know? Yeah, no, they would have definitely fucked us up with those regardless rifles because they would have went through our vehicles like right. fucking hot knife and butter. They are no fucking mm -hmm. joke. Um, right. But now those mud huts, they're fucking strong as shit. So we 
when we do have to breach doors and walls and everything, kind of do some tests. And I think one of the schools, one of the breaching schools that you can go to, they, the mud that they use for their huts is comparable to reinforced concrete. Like that oh, shit I is fucking don't. strong. I don't doubt it, dude. Yeah. Cause yeah, that's basically I, what concrete is just, I was going to say rock and fucking mortar. Right. And like the fact that we thick. mix it in a factory, you know, or the fact that it gets mixed in a dump truck and poured with steel forms. That's really the only difference. Like they, okay. So they don't put steel forms in them. They also, yeah. right. Like, I mean, hell it's still going <laughs> to, it's still going to be concrete just without the steel rebar. Yeah. yeah. It just won't look as nice. Right. It's almost like, it's almost like um, <clears throat> stucco. Is it like sandstone, Adobe stucco, like all that stuff it where, okay. You could scratch at it. And you can get, you know, you can get scrape stuff off of it, but it's going to take you a dog's life to get through the freaking mud. Like, it's not going to take, it's not going to be five minutes. <laughs> no, <laughs> you're definitely going to be there, man. Yeah. I think people, when you say mud, people instantly think like you're, like you're talking about Chuck, like dirt clods. And it's like, yeah, that's not this. Oh, they right, they yeah. found the perfect mixture because it's like mud and like there's some like hay or something straw in there. There's probably some shit in there too. I don't, they found oh, a great fucking they've mixture. Been, they've been perfecting this mixture over thousands of years. That's the thing. Like oh, you're, yeah. they're they're fighting a fifth century war, bro. They're they were just doing it with modern weapons. They they've been, you know, the Russians tried to do it. We tried to do it. Like they they know their territory. They know their land. Undefeated for what like a thousand years or something fucking crazy. Yeah, yeah, and. Anyway, yeah, I, I I find it interesting that we constantly um, underestimate. Like everything's cyclical. We talked about this a little bit with uh, mm-hmm. Patterson talking about the fall of Saigon versus the you know withdrawal from Afghanistan, and it just seems like <laughs> there's a, a cycle to it, right? So you you got the guys that went to Afghanistan early, right? And then mm-hmm. as you go on, you get the guys to go go to Afghanistan in the middle, right? And then you're even talking about right after you, there was some shit going on where you're like, dude, what is happening? And it almost sounds like, you know, like anything, when you go back in history, the longer a force occupies a territory, the blurrier the mission gets and the more like you're inclined to have corruption you can take this all the way back to roman occupation of distant lands like you know roman soldiers in rome were dialed in roman soldiers in spain may have been a little more lax because they've been there for a (laughs) while right it's it's the same thing you know you if marines have been in afghanistan for 20 years the missions uh, the purpose and mission and the feelings there are guys who started you know in the war in afghanistan that have retired you know, and are collecting a pension when guys are still coming out of basic and getting sent over there. Or they're retiring. Their kid is now going fighting the right. same war that they did. Yeah. Right. So you think it, there's fatigue's not going to set in. Complacency is not going to set in. Corruption's not going to set in. It's, it's the same reasoning behind, you know, when, when community oriented policing became the big buzzword because cops were like occupying armies. Well, yeah, none of the cops wanted to live where they were working because where they were working was so effing terrible, Mm -hmm. right? So they end up acting like an occupying army. It's the same kind of thing when you're actually an occupying army, you know, go back to world war two. And when we, when we occupied Japan and we occupied Germany, fucking you more stupid shit and soldiers got arrested and people died dumb ways during occupations of anything than they ever do in combat. Yeah. Like, at least in now combat, all you that die knowledge. from some serious shit. Yeah. yeah. All that knowledge and now they're bored. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And we all know what happens when, when uh, military men and women get bored. <laughs> too dumb shit. Or for when sure. cops get bored. You know, you get it. We talk about this a lot too. You get into this job, you get into this line of work, you get into the military and police work, firefighting for a reason, right? Your personality calls you to it. You take that personality and you chop its balls off metaphorically or physically, and you're going to create a monster like, oh, now I got to get into trouble. (laughs) 
You know what I mean? Like, I'm not yeah. kidding. Like, what's the difference between a good cop and a good, how, how come veterans either go into police work or the penitentiary, right? Like, <laughs> you know, you get this dichotomy because we're all that same type of personality. You point us in the right direction. We're unstoppable. You point us in the wrong direction and we're going to get into some trouble. Still <clears throat> unstoppable. It's still, well, yeah, semi-stoppable. <laughs> we're just, <laughs> so I don't know. I just, I just find that, that flip side is always there. It's always mm-hmm. there no matter what. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, so other story that I have. Um, so we were with the infantry unit. Um, this, I don't think this was the same one at Gunner Guard. Um, so we're clearing this town for them, town that hasn't been cleared in forever. And come to find out, apparently weed is illegal over there, which is crazy because when you drive around, some of the routes, they're just lined with pot plants. And Wait. the best... Weed is illegal. Just not poppies. Just it's not heroin. <laughs> yeah. I, it's fucking baffling. Like I said, some Weird. of the some of the routes are just lined with pot fucking plants. And the best way to describe it's like in Ted Two when fucking Ted walks over the fucking hill and it's just that big old field of fucking pot. He's like, Oh, they do move in herds. Shit like that. Um so mission was to work with infantry and some A and A guys and we were gonna clear the route into the city so that way they could um, kick down doors and collect all this fucking weed and everything. So they do that and then you see the ANA guys, once again, the brightest people on the planet, um, they just throw it in the middle of our convoy. And then they're like, well, we got to get rid of this. So they light it on fire. (laughs) Like (laughs) this massive, massive mound of weed burning in the middle of our convoy. And over the internal comms of one of the trucks, you just hear one of the gutters saying, do you guys see all these butterflies? We're like, are these what? butterflies beautiful? Yeah, something fucking crazy like that. So, yeah, he they had to write a memorandum and everything. But I just, once that happened, I was like, are you fucking serious? Yeah. <laughs> no, <the convoy. laughs> I mean, well, everyone just got stoned. <laughs> hey, Pretty much, man. yeah. Groovy. Jesus. Um, Welcome to That's Woodstock, cool. Afghanistan. <laughs> I mean, I'm well. I'm I'm guessing there are plenty of guys that you know sampled the local plant life, whether it be the the poppy or the you know hemp <clears throat> cannabis. I'm sure there's plenty of people that did it. Um, it, yeah. it. You can't swing a dead cat in Afghanistan without coming across somebody that's involved in the opium trade, or you know, and they call it the with the emerald or not the emerald crescent the um, golden crescent right so actually one of the units that was in the same um, sleeping area as us they actually found a whole big old bag of weed in one of their trucks oh wow yeah i i don't know how they got there this isn't even my truck <laughs> <laughs> these are my pants these are my pants do what happened happen was oh that that truck belonged to my cousin a and a a and a Oh yeah, right. So there was this guy. He had a recoilless rifle. Short guy, kind of a beard. You know, it's his his truck. Sounds fine. Yeah, you know, we're, just, we're holding it for a friend. That's that's yeah. all. Right. Well, and then think, um, at this time, um, uh, we're we're kind of running a little long, but um, we normally give the dedication to our guest, but um. But today, I actually have the dedication. Um, I know this this gentleman. This one's personal for you. Yeah, it is. I know this gentleman. Um, And this goes out to Brandon Sai. So I'm going to go ahead and get into the dedication. Then uh, we go to our afterthoughts or whatever after. Police officer Brandon Sai was killed in a vehicle crash while pursuing a vehicle with a fraudulent temporary tag at about 1045 p.m. The vehicle fled when Officer Sai attempted to stop it. At the intersection of Southwest 3rd Street and Pioneer Parkway, Officer Sai and another officer pursued the vehicle for approximately five miles until it slowed suddenly to turn. Officer Sai's patrol car made contact with, with the patrol car in front of him as they both attempted to slow down as well. The impact caused Officer Sai's uh, patrol car to turn on its side and strike a utility pole. Officer Sai was transported to the Methodist Dallas Medical Center where he succumbed to his injuries. The vehicle he was pursuing continued to flee, and the driver remains at large. Officer Sai had served with the Grand Prix 
police department in Texas for 11 months. And he had privileges to serve the Los Angeles Police Department in California for five years. Officer Sai was 32 years old. His tour was five years and 11 months. His badge number is 659. And uh, this was uh, this was somebody you knew. I did. I knew this gentleman. Um, he's a good kid. Uh, he's a good cop. Um, left for greener pastures in another state. Um, and <clears throat> where our, our relationship was just merely professional. This kid was a good kid. And um, he went to a state where he could do um, actual police work and pursue mm-hmm. vehicles um for just you know bo tags or fake tags or a gold-plated vehicle you know which is often you know cold-plated vehicle yeah it's police work but often cold-plated vehicles are stolen vehicles you know what i mean so he's pursuing probably what he believes to be you know fucking dirty and he has every right to do so and he's pursuing it ends up just getting into a crash like we were saying one of the last times we were talking tom is that uh vehicle crashes is one of the most uh, ways officers die in the line of duty. Um, and this just goes to show you that, that if you're in a pursuit, the pursuits are very dangerous, keep your head on a swivel. But this gentleman was a good cop. And um, unfortunately, bad accident happened and he lost his life to it. So yeah. um, for his family and friends and everybody out there, you know, rest easy. You know, we he, he was a good good cop and you know just know that he impacted a lot of lives and you know um and he's a good cop um yeah and you can't sorry, i'm fucking rambling but you know just it, it means a lot and i, I want to make sure that we do a good dedication for this gentleman because he he was a solid cop and it just it sucks when you see dudes who you know who die young and yeah. die with like not a long time on the job and you know you're like fuck dude yeah, I, I've rough. literally been exactly in that position. One of my trainees. Yeah, and well, it it sucks. You, I was just gonna say that you don't make it out of this profession yeah. without knowing somebody yeah. who's gonna meet their maker through accident or through violence. Um, yeah. you know, whether you, no matter what branch of the armed forces you're in, police work, firefighting, you know, you're somebody that you know is going to die period you do this you 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 do this you do it long enough right obviously there's people that are like no i was you know nobody ever died well you were in for six months and you you had you were on the job for a year i get it but right you if you do a full hitch in the military if you're you know whether it's some shit happening on base in peacetime or if with combat you're gonna see some shit and you know hell you go into fto you're gonna see shit by the time you're getting kicked out of your own having your training wheels taken off you know yeah and well, somebody you know and somebody you work with is going to die yep for officer size family this one's for you rest easy brother we get it from here yep. <clears throat> well, i i i can imagine brandon that you've uh you know you would uh concur with that because i know that you've you've had people that you've lost just at the end due to PTSD. Yeah. Unfortunately, that is a very real possibility in this line of work, first responders and military. <laughs> um, it's not always the wounds that you can see that can get you. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Before I even got out of boot camp, or not boot camp, I'm sorry. I ever, before I even got out of uh, the academy, we lost our instructor, one of our instructors. Yeah. Well, when you you had you had used um you had mentioned to me that you had used different coping some coping strategies and stuff like that things that you did yeah so one thing that helped me out a lot um because the biggest problem for me is like i said i had a relatively easy deployment but i still couldn't go in crowded areas um couldn't watch a military movie and go to sleep i'd have horrible dreams like just the typical stuff um my buddy brian adams not the singer. Spelled the same way, but not the singer. Um, Bummer. I was excited. <laughs> He's on my he bucket said, list of concerts. <laughs> he said, you went 100% every day for nine months because we went out almost every single day. Yeah. Like, and now everything's come to a stop. It's all catching up to you now. Yes. So that helped me out a lot. It's the real, like, mm-hmm. like, like 
there is a moment and I've seen it portrayed in movies pretty well. I'm, you know, there's a couple that I could name off the top of my head, but you know, the, we should have fucking died, man. Like that Pulp Fiction moment of like, I, I, I laugh at the, 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 part of Pulp Fiction where Samuel L. Jackson has, you know, the quote unquote moment of clarity. But if you've been a badass or a gangster or you've been whatever, you come across a moment where you go, holy shit, I should have died. And I did not. Like that's life altering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of times between that crash kind of, and then just all my couple of my airborne jumps when I should have pulled the reserve. But for whatever reason, I didn't. And luckily, it did end up opening. It's like, wow, I could have just fucking died there. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. So th- that helps. And then something else that helps, uh, Vet MX, Veteran MX, they do a lot of stuff with veterans um, and active duty as well with dirt bikes and ATVs and stuff. They get together. Um, so a rap therapy? Out- yeah, some throttle therapy helps out a lot. And then um, they there's people all over the U.S. Once a year, they get together. And everybody rides together. Um, and then, so that helped out a lot, talking with people that have gone through some of the shit that I have. And then just that throttle therapy, just getting away. Yeah. Um, that helped out a lot. And then most recently was I um, fly race drones as well. Um, so... Mm. A lot of that involves soldering. So that would kind of bring my head to the here and the now instead of years ago during the deployment or whatever it was. It would keep me in this moment. And that helped out a lot too. You um, know, <clears throat> it's funny you, you talk about like things that are, that you have complete 100% control over and that you can do that kind of like brings your mind to a focus, right? And I see a lot of people, a lot of vets who get into photography, who get into reptiles, who get into um, <laughs> something with like, <laughs> right? Uh, Subside gecko <laughs> on Instagram. No, just, no uh, but, but but no shit, like, <laughs> like all that stuff, but like in art and stuff like that in music. I see a big time with vets in music and I've come across a lot of really good artists who are vets, you know? Um, <laughs> And singing, you see them, singing about fucked up shit is therapeutic. Yeah. So it's, and it's all artistic. If you look at it, it's all fucking artistic. Even the soldering and the racing, that's still artistic because it requires skill. And I don't know very many people who can fucking solder and that is an art form. Um, so it's all artistic welding. I see a lot of welders yeah. who are fucking, yeah. uh, it requires you know, a certain vets. amount of focus. Yeah. Whether it's welding, whether it's being a mechanic, whether it's painting, there's a certain level of focus where you have to block out everything else and i think so that's the key you there's know actually you, this this guy um I, i'll fucking google it and i'll send it to you guys because i saw it on something i remember but he has a shop let's say it's in north carolina where vets can come for free and if i had if i won the fucking lottery this is what i would do what do they get Vets can do? come from free and they he will teach them how to weld and work on motorcycles and build their own shit like he supplies everything all they have to do is just show up and he'll teach them everything they need um, I can't, I should have looked this up beforehand, but hmm. well, there's a, I know there's a ton of, um, there's like a, a welder veteran welding. What is it? The wounded warriors family support has the veterans welding training. They got rebuilding, uh, motorcycle shippers has rebuilding motorcycles for veterans, but you're saying it's not doing it for the veterans. It's having the veterans rebuild it themselves. Exactly. Like so, he owns a shop. Like so, I'll Google it. And I'll let you fucking know. Um, okay. I was gonna say also with your GI Bill, if you have if you're a vet and you have a GI Bill, you can utilize that towards welding school. And if you're like, well, I've already utilized all of my GI went to college and fucked off, and they I exhausted it. You can apply for what's called a voc rehabilitation because you're like, what I went to school I for can't isn't do working. What I, yeah. it, and you just have to apply for it. It's a little bit of leeway, a little bit of a, a fucking paperwork, lengthy process, but. You go and you're like, hey, I want to become a welder. All this other stuff I did for school didn't work. And I want to utilize voc rehabilitation. And they will pay, you know, BAH and shit like that for you to go to school to become a welder. And they will pay for the school. Um, so it's it's also something to look into through the VA too is, is voc rehab if you've already exhausted your GI Bill. And if you haven't, use it too. Go to school to become or a trade. Yeah, it paid for me to go to MMI, Motorcycle Mechanics Institute down in Orlando. Uh, there you go. Oh. Okay. 
Well, Brandon, we appreciate you coming back to answer those questions and to tell us those additional stories. Cause I know we didn't get to all, we talked about that in the last episode that we didn't get to all the stories you wanted to share, but um, appreciate you coming on. Uh, and uh, we appreciate your, uh, your thoughts, especially on um, issues that involve dealing with the shit you go through over there. Cause everybody's deployment, everybody's shift, everybody's career path is different, but we all go through the same shit, even though, um, we all take different routes. We all end up at the same fucking garbage dump. <laughs> uh, thanks for having me. Hopefully yeah. I answered some questions that people had about the yeah. crash. Cool. And we appreciate you coming on. Chuck, do you have anything? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah. The thank shirts are still bomb and they're doing really well. So, yeah. Uh, thank you today for all listening to the podcast. Uh, if you like today's podcast, please go follow us. On our Instagram at war underscore stories underscore official and our Facebook at war stories podcast. If you already follow us, please share our post and our info. You can go to the link in our bio on Instagram and Facebook to reach all of our socials, our media, and our website. Our podcast is on all major podcasting platforms as well as on YouTube. If you want to support us, please go to our website at www.warstoriesofficial.com and grab some gear. We still have some Wooby hoodie shirts, patches, and stickers left. Okay. And uh, we're going to be doing some. Uh, some new gear here soon. Uh, we're just trying to finalize some some um, ideas, some logos. We got some, some actually cool ideas on. that have been sent to us too. So thank you. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, I got I got one. That was pretty cool. A uh, good idea. Um, I also want to do a sticker pack, so it's going to be like a bunch of fucking designs, mm-hmm. and I want to be able to give that to all you guys. It's a one-off design thing, and um, and then we'll once people have had a chance to buy those, do a quick you know, vote on which ones are the best and then we'll take the best of the best and make some shirts and shit out of it. Try to get that done soon for you guys. Um, so, but just be patient with us. We do have lives. It happens. Um, stuff comes up last minute that completely just wipes us out and any other free time that we have. So for those be patient with us. the locker room last week, uh, you know, sometimes you feel like you're going to die from food poisoning. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. Fuck, dude, anyway. this is horrible. Um, right. if you if you want to be featured on the show, and you think yes, you have a story, email us. If you want to share your story, please go to booking.warstories at gmail.com. Again, that is booking.warstories at gmail.com and send. But also, I want to add to that: booked. not just send your story. If you have something that you want us to debrief, because we've got a couple of things that people have sent us. Hey, what do you think about this? Would yeah. you? But send those things specifically that you want us to talk about on the show to mailbag.warstories at gmail.com. Uh, mailbag.warstories at gmail.com because that's where I get that topic stuff and it, you know I produce that sort of content and bring it to the table and all that kind of stuff so if you want to come on and share a story go to booking but if you want to suggest a topic or uh, have us do a tactical debrief on something you know um, Chuck doesn't have to do you know all of that you know he'll be up to his freaking eyeballs and emails so Send those to mailbag.warstories at gmail.com. Yep. And we are looking for law enforcement corrections, dispatchers, fire, medics, and veterans. Um, so if you have a friend who you think would be a great fit, please let them know about us and give them our booking email. Um, and then, or you can give them our, give them, uh, give us their phone number, but let them know. And then we can give them a call, but make the introduction first. So we're not just cold calling some random person. They don't know who the shit, who yeah, the hell we not, are. You that know, it's like, not uncomfortable at all. Yeah. We don't want to be like the Jehovah witnesses out here. Okay. Knocking on your door. Okay. Again, thank you for the support. Stay safe. (laughs) And until our next episode, come home with your shield or on it.